31, let's take a look at these three functions I have asked you to graph. We are going to decide whether each function defines a one-to-one -one function. If it does, then we'll go find the equation of its inverse. So each of these are parts of toolkit functions. Maybe not x cubed so much, but we, we can make that one happen. We've graphed the absolute value of x plenty of times. This is a line. Slope is 4. Y-intercept is 0, negative 7. And this is a cubic function. And if I'm not sure how to graph this, well, then I can use my calculator to help me with that. So we're always going to have technology to assist us. All right, so with that, I'm going to graph these two because they're, I, in my opinion, the easier of the two to graph. The easier of the three to graph, excuse me, 10, 10. So I'm going to label and scale axes. OK. So let me draw in the absolute value function. I know it's a V with its vertex at the origin. Okay, this is a line. Let's go to negative seven, two, six, seven. Slope's four, so up one, two, three, four over one. One, two, three, four, over one. That looks pretty good. Now for x cubed plus five, again, if, if you're not sure how to graph this, that's fine. You can start plugging in values. I'll do that a little bit, and then I'm gonna switch over to my calculator just to get a bunch of values at once. But I try the nice, easier numbers. Like if I plug zero in, h of zero, well, zero cubed is zero. Zero plus five is five, so I know my y-intercept is zero, five. All right, let me try plugging one in. One cubed is one, one plus five is six. I'm gonna plug in negative one. Negative one cubed is negative one. Negative one plus five is four. I'm gonna try two and negative two. Uh, Two is gonna give me some problems because two cubed is eight, eight plus five is 13. So the highest this gets to is 11. So it's like up here somewhere. It's pretty high up, but let's try negative two. Negative two cubed is negative eight. Negative eight plus five is negative three. So let's go over to two, one, two, three, negative three. I see something like that. Those are the five ordered pairs. Um, I, whenever I'm not sure of a graph, I plug in ne x equaling negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Those are my five go-to x coordinates. And then I see what the y values are equal to. But I always think it's good to check myself. So I'm going to go ahead and clear this out. Type in x cubed plus 5. If you're not sure where I'm getting this little exponent key, I'm going to just show you right here. It's the power key that's right above the division symbol. All right, I'm gonna hit zoom six. And okay, so that's what my graph looks like. I can draw that in. Something like that. Okay, so I'm getting there. Now it says decide whether each function is one to one. Before I do any of that, because that's the, next, the thing I wanna answer first, it's good to do domain and range. So let me go through each of these and let's figure out what the domain and range is. So I'm gonna do D and R for domain and range. Here I can see the arrows go left forever to right forever. So I've got negative infinity to infinity. On the range, I can see the lowest Y value is zero and it goes up forever. All right, here it's a line, right? So this, whenever you have a non-vertical or non-horizontal line, which is most of your lines, the domain and ranges are both all real numbers. So my domain is negative infinity to infinity and my range is also negative infinity to infinity. Here, looking at this cubic, again, my domain, I don't have a fraction, I don't have a radical, I don't have a log, so my domain, all reals, my range, I'm going down forever to up forever, so my range is also all real numbers. Okay, so with all that, let's see which of these is a one-to-one -one function. All right, so all of these, when I look at them, they pass the vertical line test, so they're all functions. 
but this one fails the horizontal line test, all right? So since this one fails the HLT, that means it is not a one-to-one -one function. So if it's not one-to-one, -one, then there is no F inverse of X and there's nothing for me to do, it's awesome. So therefore, F of X is not one-to-one. -one. And that tells me that F inverse of X does not exist. So that's what D and E, at least when I write it, um, it's my shorthand for does not exist. Okay, here, this function passes the vertical and the horizontal line tests. So since it's passing both, right, so I'll just take a little note here, passes both VLT and HLT. Okay, fantastic. So that means it is a one-to-one -one function, right, which means F inverse, excuse me, G inverse of X exists. All right, so I actually do need to go forward with this problem. Now we talked about the steps involved in finding an inverse function in example two. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna interchange X and Y. I will solve for my new Y, and then I will replace that with the symbol F inverse, or in this particular case, G inverse of X. All right, so let's try this. So my function, was y is equal to 4x minus 7. Let me interchange x and y, so I will have x equaling 4y minus 7. All right, I wanna solve for y, so I'm gonna add the 7 over, and I will get 4y equaling x plus 7. All right, the next thing I see to do is divide by four, to divide by four, excuse me. I'm gonna use my little alien ears, right, to make sure I'm distributing correctly. And when I say distributing, again, dividing by four is like multiplying by a fourth. And if I have to multiply a binomial by a fourth, I need to distribute that one fourth to both terms. All right, I'm gonna scooch this up just a little bit so I don't totally run out of space here. All right, so let's see what we have. I am looking at y is equal to one fourth x plus seven fourths. I have now solved for my, for my new y variable, and when I solve for my new y variable, it's time to write the inverse function notation. So I will just say this is g inverse of x is equal to 1 fourth x plus 7 fourths, okay? All right, we're gonna do the same thing for part c. Um, let's see what we've got. It passes the vertical line test, it passes the horizontal line test, which is great. It's passing both the HLT and the VLT. So let me go ahead and write that down. And I wanna make sure I have enough room to write it here. Okay, so passes both VLT and HLT. And because of that, since it can pass both the vertical and horizontal line test, it is one-to-one, -one, all right? And because it's one-to-one, -one, the inverse exists. So let's do it. All right, here I had y equaling x cubed plus five. Let me interchange x and y, so x will be equal to y cubed plus five. I now need to solve for y. So taking a look at this, I believe I will have y cubed equaling x minus five. Now, in order to undo something that's cubed, I need to take the cube root of both sides. All right, the cube root of y cubed will give me y and this will just be the cube root of x minus five. And if you were thinking here, well, couldn't I have raised both sides to the one-third power? Yeah, it, it's the same thing. So cube roots are equivalent to rational exponents where that exponent is one-third. Let me write that a little better. So either of these are acceptable answers. But once you've solved for that new y, it's time to write the inverse function notation. Oops, I'll leave it as a cube root. All right, oops, you can barely see that. Let me just scooch that up a little bit more. There we go. All right, so things I wanna reiterate here before we go over to our calculator and I just show you what graphing inverse, function looks, inverse functions look like on your graphing calculator. The first thing you have to do, if, if you're ever directed to find an inverse, you need to decide if a function is one-to-one. -one. All right, and 
probably, at least for me, the easiest way to do that is to look at its graph. So the first thing I did is I graphed these three functions, right? That was the very th first thing I did. And then especially when we start moving on in, into the newer material, find the domain and range of your functions. You, those are traits that you're always gonna wanna know. And I wanna know my domains and ranges because when I do inverse functions, they flip-flop. So any range restrictions would then become domain restrictions on my inverse function. Now, it, it's, a, it's a mute point here because the domains and ranges for both of these functions were all real numbers. Okay, that's fine for these. It won't always be the case. So I find the domains and ranges, right? And then I go ahead and I check, okay, did you pass the vertical and horizontal line test? All three pass the vertical, but only these two pass the horizontal. So these are the only two I move forward with. This is the one I stop. Okay, and the process is flip-flop your X and Y, solve for your new Y, and then when you finish that out, make sure you write the inverse function notation. Now, I didn't need any domain restrictions here because I had no range restrictions on my original function. And that is in contrast to when we were doing example 2b. I did have a range restriction on my original function, which became a domain restriction on the inverse. So you do want to be attentive to your domains and ranges. Again, it's just for these particular examples, the domains and ranges were all real, so I had no restrictions. All right, so with that, I'm gonna flip over to my computer and we're gonna take a look at what inverses look like graphically, just to kind of hint at what we're going to be getting at, at the towards the end of this section. All right, I'll see you in a few, bye. Email 31, I wanna take a look at these inverse functions that we just found analytically, and I wanna show you how you can get a visual on whether your analytical work was correct. So we're gonna use our graphing calculators to do that. So the first thing I wanna do is plug in my original function and its inverse, or at least what I think its inverse is, um, into y1 and y2 respectively. So let me get these functions in. All right, and then we had 1 fourth x plus 7 fourths. Okay. So I'm gonna hit zoom six. I don't know what the last window um, I used was, so let me reset. So let's hit zoom six. And you can see my two functions, or at least here is my original function, and here's what I think the inverse function will be. Um, and I want you to try and look at the symmetry involved in this. If I were to draw a line from the bottom left corner to the top right corner, right? And I'll try and just air draw it with my mouse. Oops, gosh, that wasn't great. But that, that line, can you visually see that that line cuts your graph in half, right? It, or it, it shows us a line of symmetry. It shows us this line where these two functions are mirror images of each other. And it might be hard to visualize, so let's go plug that function in. So the line that goes from the bottom left to the top right, it's got a slope of one, y-intercept of zero, it's the line y equals x. And that has to do with the fact that when we talk about going from uh, our original function and finding the equation of our inverse function, we're switching y and x. So we wanna reflect all those ordered pairs over the line y equals x. Now for me personally, I'm gonna scroll left. I'm gonna scroll left again, there we go, until this icon here is flashing. I'm gonna hit enter. And I, just for me personally, you don't have to do this. I like when the line y equals x is thicker. It, I think it just looks prettier. <laughs> I like it when my graphs are pretty. And when I hit graph, now you can see that line of symmetry going through. And you can really see how those functions are mirror images of each other, right? You see this piece reflected to this piece, right? This piece over here reflected over the line y equals x to this piece. So you've got that line of symmetry there. And, and it's just, again, another check. Here was our analytical work. Here is our graphical work. Both of those are showing us, well, actually, this isn't technically showing us functions are inverses. This graph is showing us these two functions are inverses of one another. If I wanted to analytically show that these functions were inverses of one another, I could do what I did in example one. I could do g of g inverse of x is equal to x and then I could check that g inverse of g of x is equal to x. So if you ever wanna check analytically that two functions are inverses of each other, do the techniques or the tactics that we did in example one. If you wanna check it graphically, here it is. All right, let's take a look at the functions in C. So let me clear out what I have in Y1 and Y2. 
and we're going to do x cubed plus 5. There it is now. For the cube root, it's hidden a little bit. Um, you have that square root sign, but your, your cube root, if you hit your math button, you can see option 4 here. It's got the 3 in front of the radical, so that's the cube root. And uh, if you ever have something beyond that, which we will eventually, like you have a fourth root or a fifth root, you can use option 5 where it says the x root. Um, and so your calculator, not your calculator, but Texas Instruments, I mean, it programmed in a square root and a cube root because it knew those were so popular. But the fourth root, fifth root, sixth root, they become less and less popular, so they don't have their own buttons. So Texas Instruments just made an x root button. All right, I, I do want the cube root. So let me hit option four, and we want x minus five in that radical. All right, let me go ahead and hit graph. So here comes my original function, here comes my cube root, and then we'll see if they look symmetric. And sure enough, they do, right? So we've got that line of symmetry going through. I can see that these two graphs are mirror images of each other across the line y equals x. It's looking good. So my, my analytical work is matching my graph. Great. All right, so we've talked about how to look at functions and their inverses analytically. We've talked about it now graphically. When we get to the next example, we're going to do it numerically. All right, I'll see you in a few again. Bye.